You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Dr. Gus, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. So happy to have you on and welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, and today we're going to talk about how to find a job, which is a lot of people in that are going through this kind of situations like me that are going to fellowship and uh, beginning to test the waters. And we have people that are maybe two or three years in the practice that are looking to relocate. So they're going through this. So hopefully we can provide some value for them. But Dr. Gus, can you kind of just give us a little bit of background about who you are, what you do, and kind of how we got to this point? Sure, sure. So I'm on a semi-retired family practice position. I trained in family medicine, did emergency medicine for a while. So I utilize the skills of your primary audience in orthopedics a lot. But over the last uh, 30 some, almost 40 years now, I've been both self-employed. I had my own practice for a while. I've kind of been around the block. I was the chief medical officer for the Pennsylvania Medical Society. So I got to help statewide folks. I was the first and the last chief medical officer for the medical society. Mm -hmm. And my son is a general surgeon. So I got to see him go through the uh, pain of finding a job and finding a job that he liked. And uh, that inspired me to start a website called rye.org, rateyourhealthcareemployer.org, where I attempt to, like a Yelp for physician employers, gather reviews of employers. I'm not getting a lot of uptake, and I'm hoping that after this podcast, maybe a few more folks will visit the website. I'm happy to give my presentation and uh, answer any questions. My email is on the last slide if you uh, go to it, if you're looking at it or when you look at it. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them separately from this podcast. And Wendell, you already know how to reach me. So, <laughs> Well, all right, let's go, go through it. I know one of the things that we wanted to uh, touch base on it is that you, know, you, you talk with thousands of physicians. And so what are some of the, I guess you could say, obstacles that that you see physicians are having to face when they're trying to figure out, you know, where they're going to find a job at? Well, it, you know, you inspired me with this and I've, I've actually given this, uh, I've actually had an article that said, you know, that discussed how to find a job. But the biggest challenge is that, in my opinion, there are lots of jobs out there, you know, as a physician, as an orthopedic physician or any physician, uh, you can go almost anywhere in the country and find a job. So the question then becomes, how do you do that? What's the best way to do it? I've had a somewhat colorful career. So I've been in the challenge of trying to find a job for myself multiple times. And uh, after 30, almost 40 years, I think I, I have a few thoughts for folks that are just starting this out. I think one of the challenges, and we'll talk about it a little more during the talk, is you know the danger of kind of going into it with some naivete. And uh, as physicians, we tend to take people at their word. And the problem is that um, a lot of these folks are, are paid, I won't call them liars, but paid to stretch the truth. Right. And they will make promises that they know they can't keep or think they can keep and won't. And we'll talk a little bit about those things as we proceed through the talk. All right. I'm looking forward to it. Well, thank you. I'll jump right in. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Let's do it. I've already introduced myself. I am a semi-retired family physician, almost 40 years doing this stuff since residency. Actually, it's been more than 40 years. So I have a, a few gray hairs and, uh, and some experience. CV is uh, somewhat colorful in the sense that I really haven't held a single job more than a few years. That's and true. so I've had lots of experience doing this. Although later in my career, I was mostly a, on the dark side working for insurance companies, which is a whole nother story. <laughs> So as in real estate, the key is location, location, location. And the things to consider when you're uh, picking a location are first partners and parents. Do you have a, a partner, a life partner that you are uh, fond of and think, see that they are going to be part of your life for the next uh, few years when you're picking a location? And I strongly believe that the world is your oyster. And whether you want to stay in the United States or go out international or Wherever you are in the United States, some people stay close to home. Wendell, you're leaving California and going to New York. And so you're kind of going to the opposite ends of the world in terms of the country. But one of the things that I hear, one of the mistakes that I hear from residents and other physicians is they pick a job and they say, oh, I'll just, I'm a resident. I'm used to being abused. I'll take a high salary for a few years. And I know that the job, I can tell from interviewing and from talking to people that the job's going to suck but they pay me lots of money 
And so I'll just stick it out because I'm used to being abused as a resident and I can handle it for another few years. The problem with that is that after a year or two collecting that nice high salary and being miserable, you find out that uh, either your partner or, or you have children or life changes and you are now stuck where you are. And it's not as easy to relocate as you uh, thought it would be when you took the job. And so you find yourself with a high salary, but absolutely miserable clinically and uh, professionally and personally because you're stuck where you are by the contract or by family issues that keep you in the location that you are. And, and the idea that you can tough it out for a few years for a high salary or for good pay or for whatever reason is not a good strategy because uh, I have talked to many, many, many physicians who have gotten stuck where they are, uh, again, by virtue of contract or family. Your partner uh, says, oh yeah, we can move. And then you have children and then the kids don't want to move and, and then you're stuck. So you have to be careful of that when you're choosing your location. A lot of folks go to where they live or where they trained and that's fine. At least you're familiar with the area. But again, the job is the most important thing. Being young, uh, especially as a graduating resident, you may not think about your parents, but I'm an old dude. And when, <laughs> when my 80-something-year-old father got sick, luckily, I happened to be in the right state, in the right place, and near him. Uh, but right. early on in my career, I chose a place that was close to where they were. And uh, my parents relocated to where I did my residency and ended up practicing for many years. And when my father was in his 80s and got very ill, it turned out to be very fortuitous because I didn't have to travel halfway across the country to arrange care or to take care of him. And he ended up being uh, very close and we were able to take, do all, everything that we needed for him without having to disrupt my work life. Same thing now with my mom. She's in late 80s and she's a little more locatable, but I was, I did move her so that she is uh, near me now. So something to think about is your parents. Uh, it may not occur to you, but uh, in 5, 10, or 20 years, that may be more of an issue for you than it was when you were uh, first looking at jobs. Uh, you may choose not to be near your parents, and that's fine, but just be aware, unlike I, I don't have any brothers and sisters, so I was, I'm an only child, and I was the only support for my parents. So it was good for me to be close to them when they needed help in their elder years. And that's, again, something to think about if it's not something that you, if you're not terribly close to your family or you have lots of brothers and sisters that can help out, then that's less of a concern, but it is something to think about. If I were giving this talk 10 years ago, the third P that I've added in the last few years, besides partners and parents, is politics. Okay, and, that's a different uh, one. I think now, yeah, nowadays you have to think about politics. Unfortunately, it's become a more shall we say, a spread out world in terms of lots of issues and whether you're conservative, liberal, or whatever your, your political leanings are, we all know that hot button topics like abortion and gun control are always there. Unfortunately, they are becoming more and more partisan. And, and there are some parts of the country where you may choose not to be because you don't like the local politics. And that again is a very personal choice but uh, you may find yourself very unhappy if you're conservative and find yourself in a liberal city or if you're liberal and find yourself in a very conservative city or state. Think about that. Again, I'm not directing you in either way, but in today's political world, you certainly don't want to find yourself in an area where the prevailing political opinions strongly oppose your deeply held personal opinions. So just be wary of that, partners, parents, and politics. So again, location, location, location. Are you a entrepreneurial, I want to do it all and to use orthopedics, I want to do every kind of fracture in the world. I want to take care of anything that comes across my desk. I want the ER to be able to call me for anything. Are you used to subspecialty support where you have a hip guy, a shoulder guy, a neck guy, a elbow guy, a hand guy, and all of that. So that will influence in your choice of location, whether you want to be rural urban or suburban? Do you prefer lots and lots of subspecialty support? And do you want to specialize in left hands only? Or uh, <laughs> do you want to kind of do it all? And Wendell, you mentioned you're into sports medicine. So you probably want to be eventually when you choose a place to go, you'll want to be where there's some sports and not just maybe not necessarily local high school sports, but uh, someplace where there's 
lots of teams and, and folks that need that kind of help. When you're choosing a place, if you do need a referral or a subspecialty support, where is the nearest university or large center that has that kind of support? Or again, are you a, a more rural kind of guy and you want to be able to do everything and not have to not have patients say, hey, you know, how many cases of this have you done last year? And right. I want a, I want a left elbow guy, not you, to take care of my bursitis. <laughs> What's your style, basically? You mentioned this, Wendell, and one of your supports is a recruiting agency specifically for orthopedists. Recruiters are paid for filling slots. So some cautions. I have used recruiters multiple times to find jobs, and they found me some very good jobs. But also remember that they are paid for filling slots. They get anywhere from, they get a substantial percentage of your first year's salary as a recruiting fee. Really? And, and so, yes, that's paid how they're the paid. Hospital. So there's two kinds of recruiters, right? There's a professional recruiter or what a lot of people fondly call a headhunter. And they are independent of a particular system or health system. They are paid by systems to find, to fill slots. So they'll go to an organization and say, hey, we need, a, we need an orthopedist. And we estimate the first year's salary will be $350,000. I'm just throwing out a number here. Mm -hmm. So they'll charge $100,000 to find a physician to fill that slot. Oh, wow. uh, sometimes there are conditions on it. But uh, yeah, it, the price is substantial. I didn't realize uh, it was But that they're much. paid for filling slots. Yes. And they're paid for filling slots. And uh, you can imagine a salesman that has literally, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on the line. Sometimes they are less than honest. So you have to treat them a little bit like used car salesmen and dig below the, the pretty story that they tell you. So beware of that. Be aware that they are salesmen at the end of the day. And their job is to be your friend. I have literally decades long relationships with some professional recruiters. And they recognize the fact that you move around. And I've, I have actually gotten two or three jobs from uh, individual recruiters. But yeah. again, just be careful. They are sales folks and they do, uh, they are paid for what they fill. So be careful. Flip side of not using a recruiter. So that's professional recruiters. Then there are recruiters for the health systems who generally are, are employed uh, folks. Often they use nurses. I have done recruiting for my health system when I worked for health systems. And I didn't get paid hundreds of that, tens of thousands of dollars for finding a physician. That was just part of my job. But they are more interested in, they are as, as interested in filling slots. And they are often your first and main point of contact with any health system. And we'll talk about how to find them when we start talking about searching. And searching, doing an independent search, independent of recruiters. And if you're a resident or make it obvious that you're looking for a job, and uh, LinkedIn, by the way, I think is a great resource for those of you who are on LinkedIn. Once you announce that you're searching for a job and you have your qualifications and your resume uh, on LinkedIn, you will you'll be hit up lots of folks. Oh. I do not advertise that I'm currently searching for a job and people still reach out to me trying to recruit me for various positions. So and it's a great as, place to have a presence. Post? Go ahead. And is this I'm sorry? just as a post? As in, was this... If you decide uh, no, to as a member of LinkedIn. Yeah. Right. So now, as a member are... of LinkedIn, you can advertise that you are looking for a position. Oh, okay. It's right on your uh, profile. Okay. So that's a good way to have folks come to you. Very Searching can be a lot of work. Yes. Yes. Searching can be a lot of work. And basically, if you have a geographic location, so your location is picked, you have a geographic location. It's not a hard thing to go on your favorite search engine and look for uh, orthopedic physician jobs in whatever city you pick or in the area. And especially now with the artificial intelligence built into most many search engines, they will give you lots and lots of opportunities and they will put you in touch with either professional recruiters or hospital or system recruiters. The hardest ones to find actually are the small practices that don't have the resources, the ability, the time, or the desire to do a lot of uh, searching. And, and if that's your choice, if you're looking for a job, a small practice in a rural area, that actually is gonna be relatively easy in the sense that you look at all of the, and in this case, orthopedic practices in an area that you like, call them up, say, hey, you guys hiring. Call up the local hospital and say, do you have a need for an additional orthopedist in your community? I can almost guarantee you the hospitals will always say yes. 
and the practices will often say no unless they're desperate, but that's a way of gauging an area that you're looking at if you've picked an area. And if you have friends in the community, physicians, uh, ER docs are always great to talk to if you can, if you can find them. Family docs in the community are also, or generalists, internal medicine, pediatrics, just call up a practice, ask to speak to the doc, introduce yourself and say, how's orthopedics in your community? You have a need. And if they say, oh my God, yes, that's an opportunity for you to say, hey, we could go in there and, and find a place, start a practice. Or if you approach a hospital, sometimes they're willing to support you for the first year or two in practice. Mm. Uh, and there's lots of complications with that. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little later. But if you do something like that, make sure that your contract is solid and you've had a, an excellent discussion about what to do. So, Wendell, you mentioned this, employed or independent. Yes. What I, is I your personality type? <laughs> That's right. I have. And in fact, I've often switched from one to the other. The advantages of employment is they pay you every two weeks, whether you okay. generally, whether you actually make any money or not. If you're independent. If you don't, if you don't have any cases that week, there's nothing in the bank to draw on. But employment means you have a boss, you have administrators that are going to tell you what to do and how to do it. You can give them notice. You can say, Hey, I'm tired of you guys. I'm giving you whatever contract my contract requires as notice and I'm out of here. So you can move as desired. And the disadvantage is that every year your contract comes up for renewal and you have to negotiate it. So. Negotiating a contract can be fun for some people and others hate it. And uh, you can choose to do that or not. Independent, you're invested in your practice. You, you pick a space, uh, you can't give yourself two weeks notice. You're kind of there. The money you put in is your money. The money you take out is your money. The decisions you make every day are your decisions. But you have to deal with all of the everyday issues of running a practice, like fixing toilets and IT and computers and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. You're it. You're the person to run the practice. When I had my own practice, I was the IT guy, the HIPAA guy, the plumber, it all. the electrician, and all of those things. It was, if you like that, then go for it. And if you don't, then maybe you can strongly consider more of a employed position so that you don't, you don't have to get stuck in that ownership model. Contra employment means a contract, and that's a whole nother story. We'll certainly talk more about that in a bit. So the deets, the details, here's two C's, contracts and culture. So the thing that, that you really need to be careful of is contracts. So every, almost every employer in the country will offer you a contract of some kind with lots and lots of deets, lots of details. All I can say is when it comes to that point, I would strongly urge you to have an experienced healthcare attorney look over the contract. It may look good to you, but there's devilish details in there and uh, it can be expensive. It can be uh, one or $2,000 to have an attorney look at your contract. But before you sign, unless you're an attorney yourself, it's always a good idea to have uh, an attorney look at it. Sometimes the local medical society, county or state has uh, somebody that can do that for you. Pennsylvania has a, a discounted rate that they offer through Dennis Hershey, you know. But many other states will offer similar things where they can refer you to somebody. I assure you, it is worth the money to invest in that because there are many details. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that more because some of the details are critical. Yeah. Culture. The culture of an organization, I think, is more important than salary, benefits, or anything else. Because at the end of the day, unless you're tied to a certain salary, most everybody is going to pay you a living wage. You're not going to go broke, especially as an orthopedic surgeon going to work for a health system, mm. unless you have huge financial needs. Having said that, it is terrible, and I alluded to it earlier, it is terrible to be in a job that you hate, even though they pay you lots of money. And I have spoken to hundreds of physicians who said, I took the job here because they paid me well and they seemed nice. But a year later, two years later, three years later, I don't like how it's going. They don't treat me well. The culture of the organization is terrible. If I ask for a week off, they tell me it has to be scheduled six months in advance. My kid gets sick and they say, too bad, so sad, come to work. And that's not a supportive culture. 
Mm. On the other hand, there are organizations with cultures that say, hey, my kid's sick. Hey, go. We'll cover you. No worries. Take care of it. You know, family's important. Those are the kinds of things that are that make or break your life. Okay. The culture of the organization, do they have, do they care about quality? If they care about quality, how do they enforce that? Are they going to be willing to adjust to your style? If you like certain things, instruments, ways of doing things, or are they going to make you conform to their, their chosen technology techniques? Or are they willing to adjust to you versus you having to adjust the organization? That kind of, that kind of culture is very, very important. The only way you can find that out is by asking the folks that are working there. And a caution is uh, before you go work for an organization, ask for a list of the docs that currently work for them and their contact information. If they are reluctant to give that to you, be wary. And I would call at least a half a dozen. And if they say, here's a list of docs you can talk to, I would be very wary of that as well, because you want to talk to the docs that they don't want you to talk to. Right. That's true. <laughs> and, yeah, that's a good piece of And find out from them. Yeah. Exactly. More, more details. Salary. So I've said it several times, but I'll say it again, because again, I've talked to many, many physicians who have gotten stuck in a job. Hey, they promised to pay me, you know, X thousand dollars. Wow. I can't turn that down. A year later, yeah, I'm making all kinds of money, but oh man, I hate it here. Mm -hmm. Don't get trapped. Don't get trapped by high salary. Don't say, I'm a resident. I'm used to being abused. I can do anything. I'm going to be making 10 times the amount of money. I can tough it out. Happiness is important. Don't get trapped. How is your salary determined? How is it? This gets a little bit into the contracts. How is compensation determined? I'm familiar with a health system a few years ago that offered one of the highest salaries in the area for family docs. I was, I looked into it. Even at a young age, I was pretty, pretty savvy. I looked into it. The way they did it was they guaranteed you a salary the first year. The second year was a combination of salary and incentive. Uh, but the first year salary was a guarantee on production. Okay. Uh, they also offered 12 weeks of vacation. I said, wow, that high a salary, 12 weeks of vacation. I want to go work for them. That's right. a great place to work. <laughs> and then I talked to people there and they said, oh man, yeah, they offer you 12 weeks of vacation, but you can't take it because if you take it the second year, they claw that money back because there's no way you can make the amount of money they want you to make to guarantee your first year's salary in the second year. So the second year, you end up working for half the month. Mm. Uh, so be wary. Don't be trapped. How is your compensation determined? Is it a guarantee for the first year or are you guaranteed it without any clawback clause? Sometimes they'll say, we'll guarantee you X number of dollars for the first year, but by the third year, we expect you to have produced that uh, and more. And until you're balanced, until, you're, until you've actually produced more than you've taken in salary, it may be four, five, six, seven years before you are able to leave that organization without actually owing them money. So that's, again, a, a reason to have a good healthcare attorney look at the fine details of how they're guaranteeing you that salary, how they're paying it to you, and what, what the payback is, if any. Are there incentives? If you're a guy who likes to see a lot of patients and make a lot of money and spend a lot of time in the operating room, you're going to do okay in terms of compensation if there's an incentive component. Not all systems pay incentives. If you're a low producer, you'll want to look for a guaranteed salary with no incentive. If you're a high producer, you'll want to look for a salary with incentive included. And then how do they calculate that incentive? Is it, is it based on RVUs or actual collections? RVUs are a great way to do it, especially for proceduralists, because the RVUs tend to be favorable toward procedures. But in the start of your practice, you may not have a lot of procedures. You may be seeing a lot of low back pain and non-procedural things. And the RVUs cool. don't look so good when that actually happens. The other part of that is, are they calculated on RVUs or do they include a calculation or an adjustment for actual collections? Then you have to be careful of what the insurance mix is in your community. If you're a lot of Medicaid, Medicare, they don't pay terribly well. And so if they're saying, yeah, we calculate your salary based on actual collections, you'll get a percentage of your actual collections. That may not be great if you're in a Medicaid community because Medicaid doesn't pay well. So you have to be careful. Restrictive covenants. Be wary of the restrictive covenants. I've heard had a lot of docs tell me, oh, those don't hold up. I can always fight them in court. Uh, just because uh, you can fight it doesn't mean that you can work. 
the questions about incentive or restrictive covenants are distance and from where. So if the distance is uh, two miles or five miles or 10 miles, from where? From some systems, we'll say from any of our offices. And that means that their offices are, are merely statewide versus the distance from your primary practice place. So if they've assigned you to a practice in a small town and they say your restrictive covenant is five miles from where you practice, it's not too hard to find a place six miles away from your original site. But if they say that it's uh, 50 miles from any location in our system, that can almost encompass an entire state. Or you have to even, move, uh, move somewhere else places. completely. Then you have to move somewhere else. Yeah. And we kind of already talked about it. I'll give you a story. Uh, again, the restrictive covenant was written the way it was written. It was terrible. It was awful. It was clearly un indefensible in mm -hmm. any law, in any court. So a doc signed a contract with a new system that was 20 miles away. The restrictive covenant was 50 miles. He knew that was unreasonable. No court, most courts won't accept 50 miles. So he signed a contract with the new facility. The new facility said, great, you start July 1st. The old facility said, no, you're violating your restrictive covenant. We're going to sue you and your new employer. And the new employer said, whoa, whoa, whoa. If they're actually going to fight <laughs> it, that's going to be two or three years in court. And you can't work for that two or three years because it's in court. So just because you can fight it doesn't mean you can work. So be wary. Again, if you have doubts about a restrictive covenant, first fight it. First, have an attorney look at it. Second, try to negotiate it. And I think probably Dennis Hirsch has already said this to you. There is no such thing as a standard contract. There is such yeah. a thing, but there is no such thing as a non-negotiable standard contract. Yeah. Uh, you can always negotiate. Call. Oh, call. How often? So, yeah. Oh, we have call once every 10 days and we give you the next day off. Great. And you get hired and they say, oh, you know, unfortunately, we haven't been able to hire as well as we thought. So your call is actually going to be one and two. And so you have to be careful when they say call. Is it stipulated in the contract? And if so, how? Do they hire locums if they are short-staffed or do they have sufficient backup and numbers to back you up in the event that you uh, do have to work extra call? And if you do have to work extra call, do they pay you for it? Are they going to give you extra money for it? Or right. are they going to count on the goodness of your heart and your backbone yeah. to cover it? If you're the only orthopedist in 50 miles, that's kind of tough to have backup it's true. if you have a series of bad cases. So contracts, contact hours in your contracts. So look at that. Do they promise you 20-hour uh, clinic hours uh, a week? If so, how do they do that? Is it under your control? Can you expand and contract that as needed? Do you have a say in hiring and firing staff? Do you have stipulated OR time? If so, what's it going to be? Are they going to assign you a block Friday at 3 p.m.? Or are they going to give you a better, better or choice times? So Doc, you can operate the Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday all day. Wow, that'd be fantastic with emergency yeah. cases fit in between. Great. Or are you assigned to the Friday 3 to 5 block because you're just you're a starter. You won't have that many cases. Right. Locations, contacts, do they have stipulations? If you have a, an assistant or a medical assistant that you work well with, great. If you, you know, find out you have a conflict with them or you uh, don't work well with them, can you fire them? Can you ask for them to relocate? I worked for a large health system that had a policy on staffing. Uh, their policy was that there was one medical assistant for every two docs. That doesn't work for me. <laughs> it didn't work for me. I spent half of my time hanging around in the halls waiting for the medical assistant to catch up to me mm. and free herself from the other doc. And I said, I need two medical assistants assigned to only me. And uh, I said, I, I will guarantee that I will generate sufficient extra income to pay that medical assistant salary plus some. And they said, no. <laughs> so be wary of that. Yeah, Actually, the hospital my, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and okay. it was in their best interest, but that was not, there's often a big disconnect between HR and large systems and the actual practice. Okay. Uh, I was in charge of a bunch of primary care practices. And uh, one of the biggest issues we had was that the receptionists in the family medicine offices were uh, one of the lowest paid positions in the system. So what happened? People would come in, be a receptionist, for the minimum uh, maximum minimum that they could move, three months, 
And then they would move on to a higher paid job in the system, which of course meant that our front desk staff was rotating every three months. They never got to know the patients. They never got to know the system. They were always orienting and it was terrible. So be wary of the daily details of working in an office where you have no control over the staff and how they work and what they work. So do they, does the system you're going to work for allow you to have a, a choice and a say in how you staff and so forth? So that, that's locations. How many clinics are you expected to staff four different clinics? Monday, you're in uh, uh, Office A, Tuesday, Office B, Wednesday, Office C, and Thursday, Office D, and Friday is your over time. How many places are you going to have to be during the week or are you assigned? And if you are assigned, how much can you expect to be temporarily relocated if the need arises? If they say, well, only do that if you agree, make sure it's in your contract because you're still an employee and you still have to listen to what they want. Lots of docs have multiple offices. It's challenging to have more than two. Loving it. These are all, all good gems. Hey. It's a lot of good information. Thank all you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Minmax. Paid time off. I mentioned the system that said we offer you 12 weeks of paid time off, but it will cut into your gener ability to generate. So if you take three months off a year, guess what? You're not covering yourself and it's going to be 10 years before you have generated enough income to, to practice. On the other hand, maybe you're a guy who likes to take three months off a year, in which case, how does that work? Does that affect your incentive, your salary? You're willing to work for less in order to have 12 months a year off? Great. But what is the minimum? What is the maximum? And how much can you lose it without in losing your incentive? And is coverage provided? Can you say, hey, my kid's got a soccer game Tuesday. Can I get off early on, on Tuesday? And you say, and they, are they willing to do that? Will they provide coverage? Or do they expect you to always find it for yourself? And if they do expect to find it for yourself, how much backup do you have? How many colleagues can you call upon? And what is the culture of the organization in terms of, in terms of that? And one quick question about now the practice part. Sure. Do you, sure. when you're doing this, is this, is this something where you just ask like, hey, what's the culture? Or do you, you know, when you're interviewing at a different place, you're talking with a potential employee or should you bring up yep. specific examples of what if this happens and what is, like, how do you bring that up to an organization? Sure. And I, I would always ask the question first of the organization, describe their culture. What is okay. the culture in terms of uh, collegiality? direction from above in terms of how I practice and, and quality measures and those kinds of things. Do you dictate? Do you trust in the uh, physician employees to uh, practice quality? How do you monitor that? So that's, those are the organizational questions. And then, as I said, try and get a list of the current employees, not just a hand-picked small group, but try to get a list of the current employees and arrange meetings. If they take you to a staff meeting, Wander around, talk to a bunch of folks and ask them those kinds of questions. Hey, how hard is it? To call? Oh, yeah, we all cover each other. It's not a problem. We never have a problem. Hey, here, if I need a day off, I have to beg, borrow and, and plead. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes I can't do it. So I haven't been to my kids' soccer games lately. <laughs> so, okay, perfect. Thank you. No, it makes that's sense. That's both ways. Ask the organization and ask. Every organization, every large organization has a mission, vision, value statement. They usually post that somewhere in the lobby of the hospital or facilities. Ask how much they honor it. We pledge to serve the community. And then you talk to the docs and they say, yeah, they pledge to serve the community unless it interferes with their profits. So talk to the employees. So on to malpractice. So for those of you who don't know, and I apologize to those of you who do, there's two kinds of malpractice. There's occurrence and claims made. Occurrence policies means that if you do something that is potentially libelous today and you have an occurrence policy today, you're covered, even if they sue you 10 years from now or seven years from now or whatever the statute of limitations is. Generally, that's a little more expensive because it does cover you for the time period that it occurs. And even if you stop working for that organization next year and you get sued five years from now, they still cover you. Claims made a malpractice is coverage for when a suit is brought. So if you if something happens today that's potentially malpractice worthy and it, they bring a suit to you in five years, if you have claims made, you better have claims made five years from now because that's it's coverage for when a claim is made. So if you leave an organization, that means that you need a, t a tail, what they call a tail. And a tail is, a, is an additional policy that covers the period after which you left that employer if you had a claims made policy. 
Some employers have a built-in claims made. In other words, as long as they exist, they cover you for claims made when you were employed by them, even if it was years ago. But some do not, and you assume that the organization will be in existence. Now, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but claims made needs a tail. So even though it's cheaper to buy a claims made policy, the tails, what you need to leave, if you leave that organization, is, can be significantly expensive. And on balance, it probably is in the long, long run, probably a currency is cheaper, even though it's more expensive for a year at a time. But again, that depends on where you are. Employers, total staff, questions to ask of the potential employer. Are you an owner partner or are you always going to be an employee? Some small hospitals will hire you for a period of time and then cut you loose into an independent practice. And again, contracts are important. Are you committed basically to being an employee forever? Or is there an opportunity to be a partner? If you're going to work for a, not a health system, you're going to work for a practice uh, that is not part of a large health system, then when do you become a partner? Are, is there a buyout? What's the buyout? Is it simply that you have to work for them a period of time? Or do you, do you have to generate a certain amount of income before you can become a partner? I mentioned my son. My son worked for a group. After two years, when he was eligible for partnership, he was one of the higher producers. He was like in the top 30% of their production in terms of revenue, but they had final say on whether he could become a partner. And they said, no, they didn't want him as a partner. And as it turns out, that particular group liked to do that. They would hire residents who trained under them, let them work for cheap for two years with the promise of partnership at the end. And the question my son failed to ask is how many folks have not become partners? Mm, uh, and he found question. out later that it was most of so. Okay. So be wary, uh, be careful. Uh, and unfortunately, lessons learned. Always get legal review by an experienced healthcare attorney who might ask you some questions that you didn't think about. Turnover and control. What's their turnover rate? Uh, do you have any stay in hiring, firing, adding your own staff? I mentioned that earlier. Uh, I mentioned it again. I won't belabor this too much, but basically be wary of the... Uh, and, and again, the hard voice of experience. Many large health systems have uh, HR departments that are distant to the practice that you're going to be in. They have their own policies, procedures, and, and ways of doing things. And you may find that's not very helpful uh, in your practice uh, because they don't allow you much, if any, control over your own practice. They have their policies, which may conflict with the actual best way to do things. So be wary of that always ask. Stability. You've heard of hospitals closing. So you go to a small hospital, be wary of the fact that it may be on the brink of uh, financial instability and may close. And then you have run the risk of if their practice, if their malpractice is claims made, who's going to pay for the tail? How is that covered? Are you covered five years from now after the practice, after the hospital is closed? Same for a small practice. Small practices can close. Small practices can be subsumed by larger practices or large health system. Lots of folks are selling their practices these days. So ask to look at their financials. Are they financially stable? Are they independent or owned? Are they part of a national healthcare system with lots and lots of money and potentially lots of disconnect between headquarters and you, or are they closely connected? So be wary of that differentiation between independent and owned. Summary, location, location, location. Determine your personality. Don't forget the details of the contracts and the details of your organization because culture is important. Your happiness in the long run is what's going to determine your how good your life is for the rest of your life. So be careful. Money isn't everything. I mean, money isn't everything. Money is not everything. Be wary of your own desire to, to make a lot of money and allow yourself to be abused because it will trap you in the end in a hundred different ways. So be careful of those things. I thank you for the time and energy. There's my email address. Wendell, if you have any questions or if you have any follow-ups, I'm happy to see there's my websites and please, please be, be careful of where you go. I will no, say one final word, and that is that as you're looking at jobs, places you can go, Indeed.com, Glassdoor.com are two employer rating sites that allow you to filter reviews by jobs. So you can go there, 
look up a health system and filter their reviews by other physicians or residents and, and see what other people say about them. Sometimes that can be very startling. Sometimes you have to be careful because like reviews on Amazon, sometimes the reviews are, shall we say, not entirely honest. Be wary of them. Doximity, which many of you know as a community of physicians, also does reviews of employee employers. They limit themselves to physicians, but all of those places, are, do your due diligence, use your search engines, use Indeed, Glassdoor, Doximity, and Rye.org to help you find a job. And if you're currently employed as a resident, feel free to rate your employer. You know what they're like. You see how they treat their employees. It's anonymous. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> no, Dr. Gus, I thought that was just excellent. You, you covered a, a wide variety of, of material. And, and when I go back and edit this podcast, I'm going to take some more notes of questions to ask to my possible employers. No, that, that, was, do. that was great. And for those that are listening, please definitely go and check out Ryan. R-Y-H-E, Ryhe.org, rate your health care employer.org to check out the website and go and just like you were just saying, leave some reviews on people. Like it can be anonymous. And for those that are in my position, you can go and look and see what is being said about other potential employers. But no, I just thought that was right. just, just great and, and excellent. That was, that was a great talk. And now we really uh, appreciate you coming on the podcast and, and helping out a lot of our listeners. I know this will definitely help out a lot of our listeners. It's helped me out already. Thank you, Wendell. Anytime. Again, Dr. Gus, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Those that are listening to the podcast, please go and, and leave a review, leave a rating. Let us know how much you enjoyed this episode because you did do a, a great job. And until next time.